To see you as the end and the beginning, you carry me and you go before. You are the journey and the journey's end. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It is great to be with you this morning. I bear you tidings from New York, the other great state on the East Coast that has everything. <laughs> Mountains, water, beaches, the whole shmeel. Uh, my name is Bruce Torrey, as I said before, and I want to thank you for allowing me to speak with you a little bit, and uh, thank Ben for allowing me to be here to preach on behalf and beg on behalf of the poorest of God's children in the Caribbean Latin America, and uh, to uh, share a little bit of that uh, story. I'd like to also thank those of you who have supported Food for the Poor in the past, or maybe are sustaining uh, members of Food for the Poor, your gifts are appreciated by all. Thank you so much. You all know this, so please join in. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. like to talk a little bit about grace this morning. So um, before I visited, uh, if you would ask me what I thought about when you said Jamaica, I would have said vacations, um, which I think is what most people from the United States think about when they think about Jamaica. They think about sandy beaches, blue water, big hotels, right? And uh, well, that's very true on the north side of the island. Uh, but I was in Kingston on the southeastern side of the island and some of the other surrounding areas around Kingston and, and I was actually kind of surprised, I shouldn't have, I knew it intellectually, to find out that uh, Jamaica is really much, very much a developing country with a lot of really intense poverty, right? And so it was a shock to me uh, when I arrived there and I had the same kind of experience I've had in other countries in the Caribbean and Latin America uh, that probably some of you have had if you've visited down there, uh, and that is, uh, it's a kind of poverty we don't see in the United States. You know, I mean, we have poverty in the United States. There's no question about it, but in these countries, there's not any of the kind of underlying social support that you get uh, in the United States. And so when you see this for the first time, uh, and I, even beyond the first time, when you, when you see it, it, it really hits you in the stomach, almost viscerally. It's like being punched in the stomach to see the kind of conditions that people that people live in, you know? And when I've gone on most of my trips, I've, it's been with my parish and it's been to do uh, a building project, normally build a house, you know? And uh, so you get there and you have this incredible experience of anxiety and, and sadness uh, at this intense poverty. And then you go to the place where you're gonna be working and you start building a house, right? And normally building with you are the people who are going to live in the house, right? And uh, uh, other people in the community, some who might be in line for a house, some who are just helping out, and you work with them, and you play with their kids, and you have the same experience you always have when you do a project together, right? Doing a project together is fun, right? So you have a great time, you laugh, you sing, you do all these great things. Then you look out at the poverty again, and now it's worse than the first time, because now you know someone who lives in this poverty, and it becomes intensely personal, right? Uh, and, and really, uh, very effective. And so I've always, uh, on these trips, I've always had these, this kind of roller coaster ride, these tremendous highs, these terrible lows uh, of, you know, the people and then uh, the conditions that you see people living in. And uh, every time you do something like this, you, you always meet people who become special to you, right? So on my trip to Jamaica, it was this young woman named Palomina. Uh, we drove out into the countryside uh, the first day we were there, and we, uh, and it's gorgeous, it's the Caribbean, you know, it's lush, it's green, it's beautiful, it's warm. Uh, but anyway, uh, you drive out of the countryside, and then all of a sudden it opens up on a village. And the village is not really much more than a collection of shacks 
Right? And conditions that people live in in these countries are sometimes really incredibly deplorable. Sometimes not more than a little corrugated metal or some plastic or mud walled kind of buildings with holes in them. You know, I mean, the kind of situation where the, when the rainy season comes, you literally have to gather in one corner of the house to try and stay dry right, for days uh, because the rest of the house is just letting water and, and the elements in. Uh, so we pull up in front of this kind of broken down old house and we were ushered into a room in the back, which was probably about, you know, 12 by 13, something like that, had these drab green walls, right, and had, uh, there had to be a window, I, I, I don't remember a window, so I clearly, you know, bringing some of my own angst to this. But anyway, um, these drab green walls, uh, there was just a little plaque on the wall that said, we, uh, God answers all prayers, which seemed kind of odd in that circumstance because the only other furniture were three old mattresses on the floor, right? And uh, in this room was living this young woman, Palomina, with her six children, including her two infant twin daughters, her uncle and her nephew, I believe it was. Uh, so now just imagine, you know, the Caribbean, about 94 degrees out, about 95% humidity, uh, nine people living in this tiny little room. I mean, it, it was, it, it stank, it was, dank, it was musty, it was de really depressing. So we were introduced to Palomina to talk to her about kind of her situation, and she, and she was very forthcoming. She told us about her, what, what her life was like. She was living in this room with all these people because her little house had burned down. So this was a little back room in her parents' house, right? And uh, she had no income to speak of. She was basically, uh, couldn't buy food a lot of the time, so the kids often didn't have enough to eat. Sometimes she couldn't buy enough formula for both her uh, infant kids, so uh, she was really in a very, very difficult position, and it was a really sad story to hear. But the most striking thing about her was the complete lack of affect in her face. You know? It was almost like she was like an, an automaton. You know? She answered all our questions, she talked with us, but it was kind of like there was almost like no light behind her eyes. Right? So anyway, we talked to her for a little while and, and encouraged her, and we left a little food, as food for the poor always does when someone's gracious enough to welcome us into their home. And we took off. I was there with a bunch of speakers, and we were visiting ministries that Food for the Poor is involved in, in and around the Kingston area. And that would include almost any aspect of relief and development you, development you can imagine, from just feeding programs. Feed, food for the Poor feeds almost two million people a day in the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, to uh, housing projects, to old age homes, uh, schools, medical clinics, orphanages, uh, uh, small economic development projects, uh, tilapia ponds, uh, uh, fishing villages, you name it, Food for the Poor is involved in it. Anything that brings dignity and hope to people's lives in, in these countries, Food for the Poor is involved in it. I was, I'm gonna go a little long this morning because I, 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 there's another story I always like to tell which is uh, we went to this place called Jerusalem Home, which is a big farm outside of Kingston. And uh, it w it's an orphanage for children who had either severe physical disabilities or AIDS, right? Big farm. And we, we went to this one little section of it. And uh, we met this group of orphan girls, uh, probably about 12 or 13 of them, maybe 15, I don't know. And they were probably between seven and 14 years old, something like that. Uh, and this one little girl particularly struck out, uh, um, stood out to me. Her name was Deanna. She had completely deformed legs. She, uh, it was like a birth defect. And so she actually walked around on her hands, right? Very efficiently, I might add. And uh, so we went to this little courtyard and we just spent some time with these kids. We sang some songs, I had my banjo, we told some stories, you know, we had, we, we had a great time. And we were singing and dancing around and, you know, I mean, kids are kids everywhere you go. Right? So they were having a great time. They were dancing around. Deanna's dancing around on her hands. I was having a great time. It was fantastic. Right? But in the back of my mind the whole time, I'm thinking, what would have happened to this little girl if this place hadn't been there? You know? And then you think all the kids on the streets in Kingston you know, and how many of them have no support at all. And here was this little girl who, despite the physical challenges she had, was in a loving environment, you know, good roof over her head, two square meals a day, uh, an education, which is an incredible commodity in a lot of these countries. Um, this girl was a secure, happy little girl with a, with, a, you know, with, a, with a future and with possibilities. And then you think, of course, of all the children who don't have that possibility. And again, it really strikes you. 
So it was, it was, an, it, it was a great and terrible experience all at the same time. Uh, so anyway, we, we go to all these different places, see all these ministries, food for the poor is involved in. At the end of the week, we're driving through the country and we realize we, we opened back up on the same village we started out in the beginning of the week. And what we did not know was that in honor of our visit, Food for the Poor had built Palomina a home during the week we were there, okay? Now the houses that Food for the Poor builds in Jamaica, they're almost like kits. Uh, they're, they're probably about as large as a lot of your garages, actually probably smaller than a lot of your garages. They're about 400, 450 square feet, right? Have a couple little bedrooms, little uh, kind of kitchen and dining area, a little loft over that, that uh, kids can, uh, you can put a kid up in. Uh, but they're very solid, uh, they have a good roof, right? And they have a lock on the door. This is something that we have trouble appreciating, or at least I do, you know? I mean, when you, when you, when you have a good home, you can't imagine what it's like to have a home with a solid roof on it, right? It's really amazing. And, uh, and a lock on the door, it, which is again, an incredible commodity in a lot of these countries. You can't dial 911 in Kingston, okay? You, there's not that kind of support and help, right? So women are, are violated often, kids get hurt all the time because people can just walk in and out of your life, you know, without, there's no kind of barrier between you and the world. So to have a house with a good door and, and, and a lock on it, it's an incredible thing, it's an incredible gift. So anyway, they built this house right behind Palomina's parents' house. Now, I don't know if that was a good idea or not. That's, but that's, beyond my wisdom, beyond my pay grade. But anyway, so we were, we were, we were brought behind the house and we were there to do the, uh, the kind of the welcoming ceremony to Palomina to her new home, right? Good time of year to talk about this. Uh, I remember It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart, you know, Donna Reed, right? When they welcomed the family into the house, right? And uh, we got to give them the key, you know, and say the prayer of welcome and all that kind of thing. It was great. We had a great time. Uh, but once again, the striking thing was Palomina herself because she had completely changed. Her, you know, her eyes were bright, she had a big smile on her face, she had her kids gathered around her and members of the community, you know, it was, it was just an incredible, incredibly joyous time and she had like come alive. It was like a resurrection. It really was crazy. I mean, all of a sudden that plaque in the back room, you know, God answers all prayers seemed to mean something, right? And, uh, and it was just a, a wonderful experience. And I've had a number of, I've been blessed with a number of experiences like that. And uh, every time it happens, it, it brings me back to the core of the gospel, or at least what for me is the core of the gospel. And that is Jesus's ministry to the poor, the disenfranchised, the dispossessed, right? Because that's what Jesus did in his ministry, right? I mean, we're, we, 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 we see it in the gospels all the time. I mean, you can, uh, you know, Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me, right? Jesus wants us all to be in a good relationship with God. Jesus wants to know the promise of eternal life. All that stuff is absolutely true. But you don't have to read more than a page or two in any of the Gospels to see who Jesus spent his time with when he lived in this world. He spent his time with people who had nothing. He spent his time with the poor, people who were separated from the power base of their society, whether it was for political re reasons, um, economic reasons, uh, uh, religious reasons, absolutely, um, you know, didn't matter. Jesus was there for them. And we say, you know, I mean, kind of get that story right here. We're, in, we're still celebrating Christmas. We're in the second week of Christmas. And what's our gospel today? We find out that not only did we learn a week ago that Jesus was born into poverty, right? Now we find out he was a refugee, right? He had to flee his own home. What we don't hear today, by the way, the story that's taken out of the middle of this gospel is how King Herod kills all the children in Bethlehem trying to get at Jesus. So he was a, a, a political refugee, uh, and, or a religious refugee actually, uh, and he was born in poverty. That's at the center of both who Jesus was and is and, and of our religion. And, and now we're, in, we're going into year three of the lectionary cycle, which is my favorite year because we do the Gospel of Luke. And the Gospel of Luke tells this story more uh, profoundly than any of the other Gospels, Jesus' ministry. And, and actually, not too many weeks, you're going to hear the Gospel about Jesus when he enters his home synagogue in Nazareth, right? And he comes home, and he goes to church, and he, and he picks up the, the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it's no accident that this appears at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, because the author is telling us that this is Jesus' mission statement. This is, he will spend his life fulfilling this prophecy, right? So this is the cornerstone of his ministry. And of course it is for us as well, right? As followers of Jesus. Well, our ministry, uh, in, in, a, in one of its most basic sense, senses, is to do exactly what Jesus did, to reach out to those who are in need, to reach out to those who suffer, right? And, and we all do this. And I know you're aware, but as I looked on your webpage and we, were, and we were going through the announcements. I didn't look at it in the announcements, but I mean, you know, the, the work you've done with kids in, in Uganda, the uh, medical clinic you support here, the incredibly extensive uh, meals uh, program that you guys are involved in. I mean, all these things, you know, I know you're not out there th- saying, thank God Bruce Torrey came to tell us that Jesus cares about the poor, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know you're aware of this. I know this is uh, the heart of your ministry as well. And I'm here today to invite you to be a part of a ministry that serves the poorest of the poor in 17 different countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. People who sometimes will not even survive without the help that Food for the Poor brings them and gives us the privilege to support them. And in fact, if you will open the brochures that are in your bulletin, and uh, you can read about this uh, after the liturgy, or you can go to foodforthepoor.org and read more about uh, this ministry. But uh, Food for the Poor is one of the largest nonprofit uh, relief and development organizations in the United States. As I said, serves 17 different countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, food for the Poor, uh, 95% of all gifts to Food for the Poor go directly to Ministry to and for the Poor. So it's an incredibly efficient way to help people who uh, have nothing. Uh, and if you look to the, if you look on the side with a thick yellow line to the right of center and look to the left of that, it's just uh, uh, what I like to refer to as the mathematics of compassion, right? It, it, it is astounding, and again, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, it's astounding how far uh, first world, you know, United States dollars go in developing countries. It is amazing, right? So for $3,200, you can build someone a home. $3,200, right? And if you build that home in Nicaragua, uh, it'll be matched by the Inter-American Development Bank and it'll build two homes or a double home, right? So uh, uh, what a great gift for someone like, uh, to, to give a gift the, like the one Palomina received. Maybe someone would like to build someone a home today. You know, what an incredible opportunity. Uh, it, it is, uh, you get to uh, see the family that you built the home for uh, it, it's really a wonderful thing. You can do it in memory of someone. It's a great memorial gift. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can speak to me after the liturgy. But uh, consider that. Or maybe the parish would like to get together and build someone a home. That's an incredible gift. Uh, or for $285, you can put a water pump in a village. Right? And I'm sure most of you are aware that access to potable water is one of the biggest challenges in developing countries, uh, particularly to the oldest and the youngest members of the society who are so... Uh, susceptible to waterborne disease, right? And I can never go away without saying, for $43.80, you can feed a starving child for a year. Yeah, through a lot of different ministries that Food for the Poor either does or supports, right? So for $43.80, you can feed a starving child for the year. It costs Food for the Poor six cents to deliver a rice and beans meal to a starving child, or adult for that matter. Twice a day, 365 days a year, $43.80. You don't get a better bang for your buck than that, right? It's an incredible, incredible gift. And if you uh, take a uh, finger on either side of this yellow line and pull, you'll see this is also an envelope, because as I'm sure you've guessed by now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I am not just here for your compassion, right? I'm here for your money, because money is what changes lives. And in many ways, money is the best gift we have to give, because what is so little to us goes so far in these countries. So um, I hope you'll consider making a gift today to Food for the Poor. Uh, You can do it by check, you can do it by credit card, you can do it by cash, it doesn't matter. But please give us your name and address so we can thank you, send you a tax receipt for your gift. You can hand it to me after the liturgy or any time during the rest of the morning, I'll be around. Um, And uh, change someone's life, you know, like Palomino, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, Or, or and, I hope you consider becoming a sustaining member of Food for the Poor, a pledger, if you will. Uh, my lovely wife and I, uh, my wife right here, uh, every year when we don't make our budget, 
because we don't make a budget. <laughs> so much for that. But we do do two things. You know, every year we make a pledge out to our parish so that the work of the gospel continues in our community. And we choose those charities, whether they're secular or religious, that we think are doing Christ's work in the world. And we support them every month. Some it's just a small gift, but it's a reminder of our responsibility as Christians to constantly reach out to people because that is what Jesus was about. Because every time we reach out to someone, and I don't care if we do it, if we do it financially, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, every time we reach out to someone, we become Christ for that person for just a brief moment. Okay? And in becoming Christ, we become the grace of God. So we'll end exactly where we began, with grace. Please join me again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you for having me this morning. God bless you. God bless your parish and its ministry.